Good <coughs> afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Alan Shearer. I'm the School's Associate Dean for Research and Technology. I'm happy to welcome you to our first CAD forum for the year. We meet typically every other week um, to do a few things. One is to share faculty work um, in a ways that's not just delivering it to you, but having a way to discuss it. We also have the chance to introduce new faculty, and today we're doing both of those things, both discussing work and introducing new faculty. Um, we're going to do this through a, a conversation between Corey Big, who I'm, I'm going to introduce, and then Dora Epstein-Jones, who Corey will introduce. Um, and so I have also been given the um, instruction to please ask everyone to silence their cell phones before we go down the road. So Corey Big, as many of you will know, is the program director for architecture. He teaches digital methods, digital fabrications in our classes. Uh, not currently on display, but some of you might remember from last semester, an object he built with his class as part of a design build project studio. Um, while the object is no longer here, you can see the drawings down on the wall in the tech lab. Um, they're the really great looking white ink on black sheets. They're stunning. Um, now, he also takes his leadership, though, not just to us, but to other parts of the world. Corey has chaired the TXA Emerging Design and Technology Conference, co-directed TextFab Digital Fabrication Alliance, been on the board of directors for South by South Eco, um, also of Acadia. There are a few more here, but I'm cutting into time, so I'm going to stop those things. Um, he's also done scholarship with Michael Benedict, for example, on a triple O book. We became a CAD forum publication. Um, and um, this is, I'm going to say, an important part for this setup. Corey also has his own firm, OTA Plus, which works on the same kinds of things that he does in the classroom and in his leadership roles. Um, while you can no longer see the object his studio built, you can go to Austin Bergstrom Airport and see a construction that he did with Clay Odom, who's here, from our interior design program. Um, and you can also read about that in our upcoming issue of Platform. Um, all of these things come down to the fact that Corey is in a position to not only talk about what architecture is now, but also how architecture is changing, what it's becoming. And so with that, I am delighted that he's here to have this shared lead the shared conversation with Dora. And I'm going to leave it over to Corey. Corey, Great. thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Uh, this, this really is about Dora, so but thank you for the big introduction. <laughs> um, I also have a cough, so I apologize, not COVID. It's like on my fourth week. So if I cough and break down, just bear with me. Um, and I won't go into my long introduction that I did for your lecture. Uh, I did a much more eloquent, uh, you know, el introduction for that. Um, it was an incredible talk, and I think today will mainly be an unpacking of that, that conversation and an extension of the questions that came. Uh, but for those of you who weren't there, Dora Epstein-Jones is a theorist and teacher of architectural culture. Her work mainly focuses on the discipline of architecture and includes interrogations of the discipline's boundaries and operations through examinations of tectonics, practice, and pedagogy, as well as concerns such as gender, sex, mobility, and criticality. Her work is uniquely tuned to matters of design and has been mostly published in compilations related to design, including possible mediums, the building, speculative coolness, and the forthcoming purple architecture, as well as her doctoral work focused on the history of prefabrication. Her latest work centered around collections of Morphosis and Stray Dog Cafe, notably Morphosis model monograph. A firm believer in public education, Epstein-Jones holds a PhD in architectural history, theory, and criticism from UCLA and an MA in urban planning from UCLA and a BS in applied behavioral sciences from UC Davis. She has served as a principal with Jones Partners Architecture with Wes Jones, the coordinator of both general studies and history theory at SciArc, and the executive director of the A&D Architecture and Design Museum in Los Angeles, and the chair of architecture at Texas Tech University. She holds awards as an ACLS Luce Scholar, a Getty Scholar, a SIF Fellow, a Regents Fellow, and an AIA Scholar. Epstein Jones is currently engaged in a forthcoming book, which this talk was about, uh, right, uh, for the Writing Architecture series titled The Order of the Orders, a treatise on the construction of order that produces architectural meaning, a work of fiction tentatively uh, titled Dorothy, sounds interesting, that explores the rural histories of hate in America and essays related to architectural pedagogy, artificial intelligence, and the perpetuation of the genius myth and design. So welcome, Dora. Thanks. It's great to have you here. 
Um, so as I mentioned, uh, I think this can really be an informal discussion. If anyone in the audience feels like interjecting a question or um, has a thought they'd like to share, feel free to. Um, these forums are always really nice to, to um, get a little deeper into the topics that were brought up in something like a lecture or a publication that someone's working on or a part of research that someone's working on. Um, but before we start, I wanted to get a general, and these can be very quick answers, but just to set the stage for how you think about these things, um, a definition, maybe a, maybe a, a difference between a few terms mm -hmm. uh, that get thrown around in architecture quite a bit. The first is the difference between a theory and a thesis. Oh. And then the second, and you can, I'll put them all out there and then you can decide how to answer it. The second is the difference between style and a theory. And the third would be the difference between a philosophy and a theory. Because yeah. I think since this is you know, based on architectural theory and education, there's often confusion around these terms and, and what they, they mean. So it can be a short answer, but um, just curious your thoughts. Um, well, my thoughts are very different from the kind of history of you know, German rationalism mm -hmm. and, and uh, European um, uh, ideas about what theory is or post theory or, or, or so forth. And uh, my theories are more baked out of really observing architecture and being in architectural culture because it operates very differently. I mean, if you went out into the world and asked about theory, most people would refer to Marx and Freud, right? Like that would be the kind of basis upon which we would talk about theory. Um, but uh, that's not what happens in architecture. And so I actually draft on, and I think it's interesting, I'm looking at your <laughs> next slide. I draft a lot off of uh, people like Charles Jenks, you know, um, uh, who's problematic in his own, who was problematic in his own ways. But, um, uh, and, you know, Michael Hayes and, um, uh, you know, uh, Dolores Hayden for sure has been, you know, very um, influential for me. Beatrice has mm -hmm. been influential for me. Joan Ackman is incredibly influential for me. And, um, and, and Sylvia Levin. And um, so I see theory really as a kind of positional understanding in which any one of these positional kind of situations that we find each of these firms and their work and so forth is a kind of theoretical stance. A thesis is a, is a practice of that. It, you know, you can have a thesis, and I think a thesis is more project-oriented. And, you know, so as you know, when you have a firm, your, your thesis per each project will change a little bit. It'll shift. I mean, for as much as, you know, Wes and I did, thought that we were like, me, you know, mechanistic, um, we, we often would kind of change attention um, per each project. So a thesis, I think, is, is that. And then going outward, philosophy is more about these kind of meta world views. You know, do you believe that objects have a kind of uh, consciousness or unconsciousness? Is there an ecological consciousness? Um, uh, the, 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 the sense of, you know, um, sort of existential self. And that feeds the, again, these kinds of world views. But I think the most important part for me for architectural theory is an understanding that architectural theory isn't much without its practices. Mm. So you could have an architectural theory and your practice could be historiography. Mm -hmm. Or you could have be, you know, have have a kind of architecture a, a theory is almost like a kind of orientation, mm -hmm. if you will. And um, and and I think that it gets deployed and shown through the practices that we engage in, of which discourse is one of the important ones. Yeah, and I think the reason I, I included this slide is because uh, oftentimes those categories get confused or thrown around um, as equal, and, and as opposed to going from a very specific view of something to a very mm -hmm. generic view of something. And I always found it interesting um, that, in, for example, postmodernism, um, you have the same philosophies, the same theories, people reading the same books, the same same text, yeah. but producing very different results. You have deconstructivists, you have po you know, you have of course postmodernisms like Venturi, all kind of referencing difference, multiplicity, but mm -hmm. but exhibiting that in a very different way in practice. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. I guess my next question would be, uh, how does one come to a theory? You know, in the past, one might read philosophy and then and then 
distill it down into a practice of architecture that might be a series of rules or a series of methods. Michael and I encountered this actually as a side note, but when we did the triple O book, what was really interesting to me is when we did a competition um, asking the question, how do you design a triple O object? There was zero agreement on what a triple O object was. I mean, mm -hmm. Graham Harmon had a very different opinion from you know, whoever else was on that jury, Wink and Doobledam, mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. and um, there was no consensus. And we all had different views of how that philosophy would apply to architecture, and it was so different. I mean, some people thought a pure cube was triple O. Um, I think Ian Bogus felt that way. And then other people thought that, you know, the more complex object with the most, you know, attributes was the triple O object. So, yeah, how does one how does one construct a theory? Is that Timothy Morton thought the more complex? No, that was even? probably me, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Hyper object. Yeah, that object. might have been. But he, he probably would have felt yeah. that way, too. Uh -huh. um, yeah, you know, uh, Donna Kova's bread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bread bondage. Her yeah. bread bondage yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was awarded triple O status. <laughs> got the star for triple triple O. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's coded, over coded. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it, it's all of them. But I, I mean, so there's sort of question: How do you construct a theory? But also, I mean, you started the the talk. I'm going to kind of go through the talk and, and ask questions about things that you referenced. So one of them was you said, beware of anyone telling you that theory is dead. That's a red herring. Um, thinking about how the influence of things like philosophy, external pressures on our discipline, um, they're not coming from the same places as they used to. And is that a problem in the development of theory? Uh, like. I would argue like Wait, can triple... we go one at a time on yeah, yeah, these? Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Let me ask it very I simply. I didn't get the questions okay, ahead me, of time. Let me ask so it really this simply. was a little bit if, like if theory is not I feel dead, like you gotta ring in. <laughs> 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 maybe, we, maybe we go back here and look where this kind of stopped in two thousand. But um, if theory is not dead, is it dying? Oh geez, no. No, no. I no. Oh, yeah. I was so bummed that Formalism, see, I, I was at UCLA in the 90s, right? You know, and this is kind of the hotbed of Greg Lynn and, you know, and, and sort of a collecting of friends, like what's oh, good to have friends. You know, literally, I think for Greg Lynn's um, dissertation defense at Princeton, um, Sandy Quinter and Jeff Kipnis and Thomas Lacer and so forth, they all dressed in suit and ties and they sat <laughs> in the front row like some sort of like henchman, strong arms, you know, Mr. Pink and all of that for, uh, um, uh, and, and I think that that was such a telling moment because it, it there is a, a, a way in which a lot of theory is constructed through friends, enemies, and frenemies, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I kind of agree with this person, but I don't agree this, you know? And and, and that the first question that you threw at me, which was how do you, con you know, mm -hmm. how do you construct it? I would say that a lot of constructing of theory is really, at this point now, more like a triangulation exercise. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and I think when I teach theory to students in order for them to start to develop a thesis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, I, I usually teach it according to a kind of mapping exercise that you know that that uh, they can they can start to find their voice between like what they agree with and what they don't agree with and who mm -hmm. their friends are, so to speak, mm -hmm. and, and uh, who their inspirations and precedents mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, largely are. But there was what was the next question? Is theory dead? Dying, not dead. Dying. Why dying? would it be I, dying? I, I, I'm asking you. I don't know. I don't oh. think it is. I'm just wondering. I, I think theory. Yeah. yeah so uh, I, I, I was really quite alarmed um, because uh, I had come into architecture as a feminist, sexuality, queer theorist. And um, that was my main focus. I mean, I studied Lacan, for gosh. You know? And I, I, mean, I love Lacan. Um, and, uh, you know, and I located myself in that world, but unfortunately the only practices in that world were usually film, 
Like mm -hmm. film theory was super robust right. and architecture was like interested, you know, was like, was like adjacent, like mm -hmm. interested in these, in these questions, mm -hmm. but not really going any further than the kind of spatial quotient mm -hmm. that's offered by people like Beatriz. Yeah. And, and, um, and so, um, uh, I, I came into architecture. I was, you know, I came into architecture and um, actually was a theorist who told mm -hmm. me to go into architecture is Victor Bergen. Um, I was studying at HISTCON, uh, History of Consciousness in, in, in Santa Cruz. And I was like super unhappy with the program. And mm -hmm. he was like, oh, you know, he goes, you need to practice. He goes, have you considered architecture? And I thought, oh, <laughs> that's interesting. And, um, and then... Tony Vidler, I think, was also really um, influential in that. So I came into architecture really hoping that there would be this robust theoretical discourse. Mm -hmm. And for a time, there was. It was, you know, the, the era of assemblage. And it was the era of, you know, Michael Hayes' book had come mm -hmm. out. And there was a lot, you know. And, and this guy right here was, uh, was, was uh, an influential uh, um, uh, voice and I, you know, and I thought, and there was lots of talk about gender and there was lots of talk about sexuality and, um, and I thought, oh boy, you know, I've landed, mm -hmm. but I landed kind of at UCLA right at that moment where it became like, we're going to do this digital thing and we're not going to entertain anything mm -hmm. else. And, and the strain of conceit that came, I think, out of the kind of Eisenmanian diagram stuff that was like, no, it's going to be completely autonomous. And that autonomy is what's going to allow that formalism to flourish. And I think for a time, that was a really good strategy. Mm -hmm. But it had the effect of shutting down a lot of really potential powerful conversation. So you see this like really cool work that's happening 96, 97, 98, 99, right? You know, and you're like blown away by all of these discussions about gender and race and um, simulacra and entertainment mm -hmm. and capitalism and borders and, you know, and, and then the literature shuts off like a faucet. Yeah. And we're told via people like Jeff Kipnis, right, in 2004, he's like, you know, just relax, Mood River, we're just going to enjoy our symptom, stop thinking about it. You know, I was involved in Crib Sheets, which was a kind of book that came out of UCLA that was supposed to be <laughs> shaped like a book. It was shaped like a book, mm -hmm. <laughs> about this size. Um, and uh, and um, uh, this was we had been, it was really strange. We had been assigned to write the chapter about the end of what we were studying um, as, you know, kind of the crib sheets for a contemporary era. So I had been assigned the word community. And it was like, I mean, I, you know, what do you do, right? Mm -hmm. Your dissertation advisor assigns you community. And you're mm -hmm. like, that's, but, but that means so much to me. And I have to sit here and write its mm -hmm. obituary. You know, and I'm not going to do that. And I didn't. I mean, I wrote something that was totally unacceptable and everybody was mad at me. <laughs> Fine. Um, uh, but, you know, I kept that up. And I kept that up at SciArc, too, yeah. which was not always the most popular position, uh, position to be in. I think now, actually, we're in a whole really exciting period mm -hmm. because we are having some really substantive theoretical discussions about what architecture should be doing, mm -hmm. where architecture should be going, how can we impact and, and move the profession to, you know, and how can the profession feed us? Those are, those are big theoretical questions. So yeah. no, I don't think it's dying at yeah. all. I think it's thriving. That's great. I, 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 I think that's really great. And it, it, um, I'll get to it a little further in our, our talk, but I think it's exactly the point of your lecture, which was, you know, when you talk about Perot, this idea of averaging and, and finding the, the essence through a, a process of averaging. I think theory was that for a really long time. Yeah. Like this diagram, I think, is dead because the, this was based on, and Jenk says, you know, he quotes Gropius, and he says, a universal international style mm -hmm. stemming from the facts of new constructional means adequate to a new industrial society and having as its goal the transformation of society, both in its state and social makeup. There's yeah. nothing more generic than that description. 
And so trying to coalesce everything into that description, averaging all the diversity of different ideas into that one model, I think is what theory was, yeah. you know, at that point. And so hopefully but I that think theory's dead. Architectural thinking yeah. was that yeah. too. You know, mm -hmm. I mean the thing that's interesting about Jenks, Jenks's diagrams today is the way in which they uh, rehabilitate the primacy of the line and the line becomes a kind of 2D representation of an unfolding you know of he calls it the evolutionary tree but there ain't much tree about right. it right you know and and so um, but I think now when I talk about like positioning or when I talk about you know triangulation or even when we talk about lines anymore, I think we're much more dimensional and then then this this is too reductive. Yeah, right? that's yeah. right. Yeah. All right. So let's get into the the, the kind of meat of your talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh man. Yeah, you know this one. Um, so new variations on the row complex. This is Greg Lynn um, talking about. Um, uh, well, you you've mentioned the idea of, of I think you called it uh, not absolute and arbitrary. That's what Roe called it. Um, you called it. What did you call it? The customary. The customary. The the. Um, did you call it the absolute and the customary? Well, no. Perot calls it the absolute. Yeah. He calls it the absolute and the arbitrary, and then he traces trace off yeah. those words. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, arbitrary and customary. Mm -hmm. But I think you know that that essay. Your your talk reminded me of that Greg Lenn essay where he talks in the new variations of the row complex about pre. This is pre collage city. So this was when was uh, when Colin Rowe was interested in analytic formalism, um, and his idea within the mathematics of the ideal villa was a sort of averaging. So same mm -hmm. sort of thing. And he was trying to connect Palladio, which is on your left, to Le Corbusier on the right. Um, and trying to find an averaging where you could connect these two things throughout history and then find these hidden grids that would then connect them. But it's a similar process to what you were describing mm -hmm. in trying to find a new French order, mm -hmm. this, this mm -hmm. process of averaging. Mm -hmm. and, um, the Perot tries. I, he yeah. fails miserably. Yeah. 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 As yeah. does this, I would yeah. say. Um, I don't know, man. You see, you no. see some Palladio in there? No, I, I think that <laughs> Roe, I mean... I think Roe was really trying to say that Le Corbusier did it better than Palladio. Mm. And that 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 what will become the thesis, in fact, written here, like maybe even in this room, mm -hmm. the thesis of uh, uh, phenomenal transparency mm -hmm. um, will carry that argument ultimately for Roe. That that mm -hmm. you know that that Palladio is just you know, literally like blocked. Yeah. And you can okay. see the yeah. effect of the masonry versus the the, yeah. the way, you know, the permeability of the the open plan yep. in this. And so I actually think Roe was trying to say, hey, Corb did it better. Right, right. You that know? there was never yeah, that's the the twelfth villa, which is the one that was actually correct in the nine square and all that all that. Um yeah. 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 But what was the question about that? Um the question was in this next slide um, the problem with that, and you mentioned in, uh, this idea that that um, that it allowed for inaccuracies, the system that Perot was using. Um, the problem I, I would have with something like like this, which is a continuation by George Hersey and Richard Freeman of using other um, variations of the the Palladian nine square grid to produce all these results, does it become um, so generic and so different? that you actually lose the essence and the core of the thing itself. OK, so my great, this is so good, because this is the, the part, hard part to communicate, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, I believe very strongly that there is no essence or core. Mm -hmm. And um, moreover, I usually believe that the, I can usually trace any kind of eidos Mm -hmm. to usually a privileged Western European mm -hmm. view. And so when um, Roe says, oh, it's the nine square that haunts all of the variations, um, he creates an eidos. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think in Greg's essay about that, what he's trying to do is he's saying, now let's imagine an architecture that doesn't have an eidos. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that a lot of the digital computing that happens after Greg still takes the kind of primitive or the nine square and transforms it as opposed to 
trying to insist on a kind of non eidetic you know, character, if you will, in, 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 in the first place. And I think that I, I struggle a lot with that because character is oftentimes a reading against a norm. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to say very strenuously is a norm is what we make it. Yeah. And if that norm smacks of waste, privilege, racism, right, then it's time to do something about the mm -hmm. norm. And we need to feel free to do that because the norm is just a construction just like it's the norm hides in this this ontology that goes from not just row mm -hmm. right but uh vitcover before vitcover yep. it's bolflin right you know and it go da, 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 back Christopher and Wren, Wren mm -hmm. yeah you know i mean it's it 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 it, it goes back but it's established, and they're hard to overcome, these kinds of norms. The nine square, it feels really impossible yeah. to overcome. It feels like it's this, like, essential ingredient in your pantry, right? You know, the, mm -hmm. the architect's pantry. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I think that's the issue, is yeah. that, that uh, uh, look, I think we can respect a norm, I think that a norm can help organize thoughts about what we consider to be the discipline, right? We all know what a nine square is in this room. Mm -hmm. um, and I can respect that norm, and I can respect the levels of expertise that have uh, uh, piled up onto uh, um, that norm. But that doesn't mean that the norm is without question. Mm -hmm. It's not permanent. It's not universal. It's not... You know, um, and we we have to stop treating it like that. And I think that one of the interesting things that I see a lot with pervasive computing now with, you know, especially in teaching students is the idea of the primitive, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the geometric primitive. And, and it's like, wow, we're really reinforcing that Plato with them. And mm -hmm. I'm like a little worried about mm -hmm. that. Like, I, I, I think that that's, you know, that 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 is something we should be at least making transparent. Yeah, I think that's great. My next question was going to be how do we intervene in that sequence, but before before I switch to this next slide, which is um, going to change direction okay. of the talk, it's a slide of moldings and lows. Uh, I want to I want to open it up and see if there are any questions before we before we keep going. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? All right, we'll wait till the end then. I'll go right to the lows. Um, it's something that we talked about at dinner, something that you showed, this, this theory of the moldings. And, uh, you know, I think what's so interesting about it is that, um, you know, this is the customary. Like, this is the customary that we're used to. It's, act it's actually outside our profession at this point. All the stuff we did as architects and designers, tier designers, has now shifted outside our discipline and become customary through the consumer, through the distributors, through the manufacturers. Um, to the point, and we talked about this, which is the point that contractors will include this stuff even without you, you asking for it. Right. So you'll draw a door, and it'll it'll have the detail you want with a really clean reveal and all mm -hmm. that, and then you come to the job site, and there's like a, a molding yeah. that has nothing to do with your drawings. And I think part of it is this. Sometimes that hides the mistakes. You know, it does hide the mistakes. It's a lot cheaper to actually include a molding in terms of labor than it is in terms of material. Yeah, but even also though, if you slop up that. Right, material. yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, it is true that the less material you have, the more expensive it often is. Uh, supposedly. Well, yeah. Supposedly. I mean, I, I found that oftentimes the more minimalistic we were in our practice, sometimes it got really expensive because the labor was more expensive. Well, yeah, that's right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. The material is see. more expensive. The labor is more uh, right. Labor is more expensive. Material right. is cheaper. Yeah. But OK, yeah. So they'll add material, even though that's more expensive yeah. because it reduces labor costs. But I think part of it comes down to like professional practice. At some point, we added this to our contracts, which is the architect will not be required to make exhaustive, continuous on-site inspections. You know, basically saying that con the contractor is in charge of the means and methods. Um, the contractor is expected to make reasonable inferences from the contract documents when the documents show wall partitions, for example, covered by drywall. It may be inferred that some reasonable method will be used to attach the drywall. That goes beyond screws, I think. And so that's this opening that we've allowed others to take over part of our design process. And mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. my question for you is, you know, you talk about um, tectonic comfort and um, 
when the tectonic comfort exists beyond the realm of our discipline, how do we intervene within that decision-making process? What do you mean that this is not in our purview? Yeah. I, yeah. Well, I don't trust contractors would be the first. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll expand it a little more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, what do you mean? Um, I'd expand it saying that most buildings are not actually designed by architects, that we've sort of created um, models for which other like other people can build architecture. And those models come from architecture, but they're constructed by others. Yeah. And so how do we pull back those uh, parts of the design construction process that mm -hmm. were once within our realm, that have mm -hmm. now left our realm, and then taken on a life of their own? Because I, I say this because your, your argument is against tectonic comfort, and that seems to me to be now outside of our discipline, actually, mm. a lot of it. Yeah, I don't know that it's completely outside mm -hmm. of the discipline. Um, and, uh, and, and I think a lot of the, the, the newer, medium-sized buildings are kind of good examples of this, and this is what made Kevin, Kevin's question so good, mm -hmm. is that, you know, um, uh, because that type of construction now is uh, based on, you know, mostly panels, and uh, there, there isn't really the um, uh, sort of deep furnishing, we'll call it, of the wall and the wall detail. Um, uh, that that's cut down a lot on these flibberted units that you know these capital whatnots that are you know that are that, that are pervasive, um, and you know he's not wrong um, uh, uh, about that. So that would lead an answer that would say that you know the the building industry is also looking for the most efficient thing, and and I think that there are certainly collaborations and alliances that can be made. That you know suggests that you know, hey, it's okay. You know, we won't we won't draw it in if you won't build it. And it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> all right. <laughs> we'll see if that's okay with the client, mm -hmm. right? Which is the other you know ghost in the machine here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, but but I think I think that's it. But I think that you know, in terms of what I was talking about, which is the climate emergency, mm -hmm. I think that you know we in architecture need to put some hard stops on just our ethics of responsibility and you know and one of them is don't draw it in mm -hmm. if it's you know don't don't specify it don't you know drop that ceiling if you're not gonna I mean we had and go ahead and confront and mm -hmm. and feel like that that's an okay thing to do so we had this thing where we were doing a the cogeneration plant at uh, UCLA and I almost showed that during the lecture, because the cogeneration plan at UCLA, so UCLA, they wanted all their architecture to match, right? You know how college campuses are. It's like, you know, everything's got to match. I love the soffits, by the way, <laughs> at in in across UT, because um, in the historic yeah, the buildings, colors, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the historic buildings, they have the the, mm -hmm. the actual relief pattern, but in the newer buildings, it's just like squares of color, yeah, right? Like, right. you know, but that's what I'm saying. That's yeah. where somebody was like, okay, yeah, maybe we won't do the whole relief yeah. thing. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe we'll save right there. Um, uh, but, you know, with, with Cogen, um, uh, that project, um, you know, we wanted to like celebrate the, the the sort of mechanisms and everything. And the one thing that UCLA came to us and said was hide it. Mm -hmm. You know, that the culture of mechanical infrastructure building was one where, especially in Los Angeles, where there's like a usually a shed or a pretty type of classical building, you know, the train station approach, right, where you hide the mechanisms. And we were like, no, we want to celebrate the mechanisms. So we put all of the mechanisms sort of on the roof mm -hmm. and you know so it just had like this this you know craziness up on the up on the top and um and you know ucla they were they were like they were mad you know and they were like ah oh, you can't do that so we went back to the engineers of cogen of the cogeneration plant not mm -hmm. the building engineers but the but the cogeneration plant engineers mm -hmm. and they were you know ask them can you perform the calculations on what would it be like if you uncover these mechanisms and they're like it works so much better it's so much more efficient if it's uncovered it doesn't have any of this heat gain and da 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 da, -da. you don't have to cool it as much you know and they're like it's so much better if you expose it and especially in mild southern california yeah. and um and so we were able to go back to the 
client and say, mm -hmm. look, you're going to save X amount of money, you know, and we just put it in dollar terms yeah. simply by making it. And I think that we need, as architects, I think that we definitely need to collectivize on this and say, look, yeah. climate emergency, as long as we're in climate emergency, as long as environmental justice is at stake, as long as this is what's happening, we have to suspend certain operations, you know, just yeah. like the COVID emergency got rid of the food or the cookies, you know. Um, uh, sorry, Alan, I don't mean to... <laughs> you know, um, uh, I, I, I think we need mm -hmm. to be brave enough to, to, to be able to say, yeah, you know, no, you can't, you can't use this. We can't specify that off-the-shelf item. And BIM yeah. is not helping this, by right. the way. BIM is, you know, I mean, Revit in particular is not helping this. And I would love to see Autodesk get in on this discussion so that the only materials and the only um, parts and, and pieces that you can specify from Revit mm -hmm. are ones that have a climate responsiveness. It's interesting. I mean, it reminds me of a conversation I had with Bill Chrysler, you know, Chrysler and Associates, mm -hmm. uh, who does all the fiberglass work. And um, he always has a, you know, fiberglass is not environmentally friendly, the mm -hmm. process is not, but he has an argument that, you know, by using fiberglass, you're reducing the amount of weight on a building. Mm -hmm. And so for the SF MoMA, for example, they convinced Noetta to use that as that, opposed yeah. to precast because mm -hmm. reduce the steel by, you know, 60% and therefore reduce the carbon. So there's, there's, there's dots that have to be connected within mm -hmm. that, within that model in order to understand the, the ramifications of maybe even a environmentally poor decision, but in a larger larger building becomes mm -hmm. an environmentally friendly one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's interesting. Um, okay, maybe brings me to the next slide, which is a simple <laughs> question, and you you mentioned this and but didn't expand on it. And I'm super interested in what you said, which is um, humans need ornamentation. Yeah. Yeah. Me Why do we need it? What do we need? <laughs> I don't know that. I mean, I don't that I buy the whole anthropological discussion, you know, it, it, it had always kind of stemmed from that golden bow sort of, you know, crazy late Victorian. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I, I think that uh, we thrive on expression. That's how we communicate with each other. Um, it's uh, how we, you know, pass on meaning to other others you know it, and um and uh, uh I, I i can't imagine the alternative yeah i really can't i mean i i, I you know i wear however 15 earrings mm -hmm. or something like that. I, I can't, my body is marked, you know, and so mm -hmm. forth. I mean, Lois would hate me, right? You know, which is fine. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I just, I can't imagine um, yeah. uh, that as, as, as not being, as not being something that is acknowledged. Yeah. I, I just wanted to underline that I think, you know, one might listen to you and think a reductivist model would be the way to go, but you, that's not what you argue at all. And so I want to point out that there is still exuberance within this, this, this change in direction and design. And I think that's really important that we maintain that. Oh, but, it's not just exuberance yeah. in the design, but the, but you know, sort of the mean fact that 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 maybe if we went the absolute most efficient way, it might not be square. <laughs> If we went with the absolute most climate responsive and what seems to be indicated in all these fab labs across all of these universities where this great work is going on is uh, that, um, uh, that, that if we really want to act in a way that is responsive and responsible to a climate emergency, then chances are we're gonna have to give up squares mm -hmm. <laughs> and beams and posts and you know and all of that stuff that we know and love right now and that we're so conditioned to mm -hmm. you know um uh to be I, it's very dismaying to me when i look at like the range of practices and i see people who are in in the fabrication you know sort of realm and they're happy to like make a bench that's like like yeah, this right. but then when it comes to doing a building the yeah. building follows all of 
those, you know, those, those norms. Now I know how difficult it is. I mean, we've had, uh, um, you know, building inspectors who said that we couldn't use shipping containers, reuse shipping containers because the structure on them can't be inspected. And, um, and so we couldn't use them structurally. So we had to put in a steel frame in addition to the shipping container, which was totally Mm -hmm. redundant to it. Mm -hmm. But the, but, but, but the fact is, is like, you know, fiberglass or Greg does, a, Greg Lynn does a lot of stuff with, um, you know, looking, he, and he actually got very frustrated with this, looking at boats and mm-hmm. how like boat hulls are, are, are really in many ways the more efficient form of, of, of building. And um, so it's probably, if we really went climate emergency, mm-hmm. I don't think that the built environment would look the way that it right. does climate. I agree. And I think that that's a hard pill to swallow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you're pretty sure it would look curvy? Um, I don't know that it would. I don't know. I don't know the, the, the answer, but I do know that it probably wouldn't involve as many layers of finishes, ornaments, so forth that we see that we see now. And so we would end up heading toward a self-supporting shell. And if the self-supporting shell has to curve in order to create stability, then yes, there will be curvature. But uh, but but that's that's really where, you know, I mean, at one point we give way in modernism. We we I mean, we give way in the in the history of architecture from masonry to the frame, right? And we go, "Oh, okay, the steel frame is 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 the end of that. But the steel frame required all kinds of out, as you know, outfitting and cladding and interiorizations and depths of wall and, and poche and so forth. And, um, and, and I think that, uh, if, you know, we think in terms of like, okay, we're going to just use a kind of composite material pressed once, you know, or milled once into, in, into position, and that has enough structural stability with it, chances are it's going to be curved. Mm-hmm. I don't think it has to, but loads are loads. Mm-hmm. And loads, you know, I mean, it's like the Romans, right? The Romans are like, yeah, let's do an arch. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> you can imagine the, 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 the <coughs> The Etruscans among them, you know, are like, ah, I don't know, that arch looks like really suspect. Well, no, it can carry a load, you know, and and so it's got to it's 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 got to do that. But of course, you know, the arch gets all its stuff. So, yeah. 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 All right. Well, la- last question. I'll go back a little bit to um, the theme of the topic and, and the idea of the customary. So, Christopher Wren. Um, says there are two causes for beauty, natural and customary. Natural is uh, from geometry consisting in uniformity that has equally e- that has equality and proportion. Customary beauty is begotten by use. This familiarity breed, uh, breeds a love of things, not in themselves lovely. And so this is a question kind of I'm going to project from that into AI, which has great. Uh, great opportunity and great flaws. I think the flaws are very clear, which is that all of us have these biases, you know, all the things that you mentioned that are customs and have become part of our our understanding of objects and why we choose objects, and we don't always know why we choose them, but they're based on kind of these conditions, mm-hmm. versus um, the value architects bring in selecting these images. So these are like just a snippet of, you know, thing choices that it's it gives you. You know, mm-hmm. AI generates thousands of these choices, and as an architect, is this like a plaza? Yeah, like a plaza. Okay, okay. It doesn't even matter what it is, but okay. um, but it's a lot of things. And an architect, uh, I think, is a better curator of this stuff because they have a history and a knowledge of architecture. And so when they judge and choose and curate all these images, they use that knowledge, they use that understanding of what, what a space might work, what which one might work with. But it, it's conflated with all of those other problems. And so maybe this is a rhetorical What do you question. mean, all, all the customary? Yeah, the aspects. customary, mm-hmm. exactly. And so... Um, how, this is a rhetorical question, I guess, uh, your thoughts on that or how one might come to terms with those two discrepancies? Well, I find it really, um, intriguing that, uh, AI comes along and then all of a sudden people are talking about bias, mm-hmm. like, you know, and, and, uh, it's like, well, why weren't you talking about bias <laughs> before? Why, <laughs> yeah. you know, 
what the heck, right? <laughs> you know, it's like um, we we need to have been having that just that biased mm -hmm. discussion before the AI ever walked in the room, so to speak, and um, and and so I yes, absolutely, we have to be interrogating ourselves every time we come out with any kind of assertion right you know and a lot of architecture is an assertion right oh we must start with this grid or you must occupy you know um a, a footprint in this way or you know there must be this you know this this type of egress and that type of egress you know or something like that test those assertions first mm -hmm. against whether is it a customary assertion you know mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. we got a lot of flack in our office for for inventing architecture that that nobody wanted to occupy mm -hmm. you know um but in many ways it was about oftentimes sitting around as a group and wes always used the word we right and I, <laughs> one time i was like that's short for wes um uh, but uh uh but, but <coughs> we sat around and, and we would we would jump on our assertions, right? Like, well, why do you say that as if it's a normal case? Why do you say that it has to have a parapet wall or mm -hmm. something like that? What what is what is driving the normalcy in you know in in that in that assertion? And um, I actually I want to kind of sidetrack here. Mm -hmm. I, I have a recent article. So I wrote this article about AI, and it it ended up kind of disappearing and I'm hoping to like, you know, bring it back because uh, uh, it just sort of the route on the route to publication, yeah. it didn't get to where it needed to go. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, but, but I'm surprised too that the AI is talked about as if it has a bias and we need to somehow cure it of mm -hmm. its bias. Um, uh, we're the ones with the bias, right? right? It's mm -hmm. like when your kid uses a swear word, yeah. right? Like, I don't know where he learned that, you yeah. know? Oh, I got to teach him, right? You know, it's like, no, right. the kid is imitating you, right? right. Yeah. And so when the AI shows these biases, that's, mm -hmm. see, because that's what I'm saying. I think you could go along here and say, okay, where did the AI start to make a norm? Mm-hmm. You know, and can you can you find those places? Could you map that among mm -hmm. these images where that norm seems the most kind of egregious? I mean, I really trip out in AI, like how like Thomas Kincaid most AI images are. They're super like romantic and soft lit and soft focus and the dark. You know, I mean, they're like they're like J M W Turner or something paintings, right? You know, and um, and they're very painterly mm -hmm. in in that regard. And and I'm like, where'd you learn that? <laughs> in the same way that. Yeah. The kid with the square word, right? That yeah. you, you got to say, where, where'd you learn that? And, oh, we're still doing this painterly right. thing. We do it with our renderings. The sun is shining. The clouds are out. The kid has a balloon. Did you know that that's the most copied? No. Uh, the the most uh, the the uh, the most copy rendered um, uh, images of the back of the yeah. parent uh -huh. and the kid with the balloon, yeah. like some sort of weird it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Look at the sunny sky. Yeah. Right. Well, I have a whole, you just opened a whole line of questioning about tool, <laughs> tool use, which I might disagree with you, that, yeah. that we only have the bias, because I think tools, there's, we can talk more about that, but we only have nine minutes, so I want to open it up to the floor. But I think that the tools drift toward the master narratives that are abound. Yeah. So, I yes... It is an in type of intelligence, and yeah. yes, it does have a little bit of its own autonomy. But right. like, but it's like and, the kid and, uh, that swears. Yeah, I mean, it, it builds a series of constructs around it. Think of guns, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. And so, anyway, we can go in a whole other discussion about it. But any comments, questions? So I have a question about the theoretical underpinnings of a climate-challenged architecture. I think that might have more in common with Galileo and, and Einstein than Freud and, yeah. and uh, Jung. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Where, where the sensibility of empiricism, hypothesis testing, 
and that type of theory might play a role. Yeah, I I agree. I I do I do agree. I mean, and I think that we're you know we do suspend a lot of the philosophical call it or you know orientations or even metaphysical ones um, when we talk about something like you know giving over architecture at this point to um, uh, to a climate emergency. But I think that 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 what's you know kind of the potential that keeps it from being just a kind of posit positivistic or you know empirical type of study is uh, that there's a lot of uncertainty in you know and um, so I'm really intrigued by some of the proprietary uh, modeling software that uses algorithms in order to project uncertain you know in into that uncertainty because once we have that actually we do sort of return to uh, um, uh, maybe something that is a, a bit more um, uh, pre-Hegel, you know, um, pre-Hegelian. Um, Is that more methodological than, than theoretical, though? Um, it whatever is theoretical will yeah. be played out as a methodology, yeah. you know, and, and that range of methodologies is innumerable. Right. That's and that's that's the cool thing I think about teaching <laughs> architecture students yeah. is that you say here's a methodology in the studio and here's a methodology and here's a methodology and here's a methodology and then they become you know they 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 pick up their own pieces of that and they curate yeah. their own. Yeah. That's what's kind of interesting about a thesis actually. And I think what's super important is that there's there's a, a huge territory when when one's designing toward climate emergency. There's a huge design territory there. I mean, I, you know, that could be in that, this could be in that territory. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that, you know, there's still theory within that design agenda that it has a lot of room to expand and be narrowed down and focused on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. biases like real about what architecture is. And particularly who creates architecture. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm interested in some of the implications of your your introduction or your swapping of this notion of customary theory for bias. An understanding of the kind of bias as reinforcing for certain norms and practices and elevating certain types of folks. Mm -hmm. uh, the implications for the notion of authorship mm -hmm. in comparison to something like Mario Parko's notion of um, the, al the mm -hmm. algorithm and the way that, uh, you know, that every company that needs technological paradigm is supposed to free everyone and everyone can become <laughs> an author. It never happens. It says we remaster that narrative and we yeah. introduce a kind of deal. And so uh, in my mind, I, the only thing I push back against sort of uh, maybe Corey's suggestion that certain things have left the profession. I think actually the profession, as I see it, tends to cherry pick mm -hmm. things in life to reinforce a certain notion of authorship in the middle. So if we look at the built environment broadly, there's a lot of authors out there, mm -hmm. there's a lot mm -hmm. of them. Um, and for certain reasons, certain biases, they don't come into our practice. Mm -hmm. But we are trained to think of it as sort of, well, we've dealt with that issue, so it's not a concern right. for us. Really. And so I'm wondering then if that's the case, if, if we press on this notion of, of the order of the order, or the, the order of this narrative, that sort of reinforcing bias. How can we introduce that into design studios mm -hmm. and architectural practices? Mm -hmm. Not in the ways that mm -hmm. sort of, um, uh, you know, like some epistemological critiques, but sort of this kind of autonomous practice where we're so overly conscious of what it is, a, a self-reflexive thing, but one that allows for the architect to be much more porous with the built environment, to be much more willing to look at and engage with multiple authors and multiple ways of curating the built environment. Because what I see is it's constantly a kind of re-policing of the boundaries yes. of the discipline. Yes. With new technologies, new forms of practices, new whatever, but none of that changes. None uh -huh. of that allows for other types of authors as well. And architecture still remains capital architecture. Um, and I'm wondering if there's a notion of authorship in the critique you're making that might make the studio and the practice a bit more plural in the sense of 
where they fly with inspiration and who they fly with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that the authorship question is, is super pervasive. I think in many ways it's it's authorship and the myth of authorship that and and you know this genius myth mm-hmm. that constructs for us or reconstructs for us a policed boundary of uh, what that thing is called a discipline. Um, I think for. For though in the purview of a school, you know, in 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 my mind, if I'm um, in the roles that I've had where I've been able to tackle like what's the pedagogy of the school, one of the things that I believe is that we I believe we have to model for the students what what we ultimately believe as architects, and I think that what we ultimately believe as architects is actually pretty looser than what we probably represent. <coughs> and so I believe in things like I I have a paper on the flexible canon, what I call the flexible canon, which is the ability to look at all of the texts that you assign to the students, mm-hmm. you know, in any given academic year. I mean, we had this great moment at SciArc where we went, okay, what's everyone assigning? And we looked at all of the studios and all of the, 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 the classes, and we had assigned like nine times to the students Stan Allen's from, from <laughs> objective field. And it was like what we were saying to those students was that was the most important essay in, uh, in, in, in the field of, of architecture. And none of them had read Gideon anymore, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so I think saying, okay, there is a flexible canon and that mm-hmm. flexible canon has to be exactly how we model the diversity that we want to see in these, in, in, in these curricula and show, for example, so many other tectonic practices, right? That are available to us that we don't have to even in, go invent. They just exist in the world. And, um, you know, but, but it, it's, that has to be a concerted effort. And I think that what I'm talking about too here in general is the concerted effort to question our own biases, our own sets of senses of comfort, our own senses of like, oh, I have to teach Stan Allen because that's the only text I know or something like that, which is absurd. But right. let me just follow that up quickly because I think that um, what you're describing, which for me is very productive, is something that could be formalized within the domain of the discipline as it's described mm-hmm. and, and reinforces or pluralizes the type of authors that are there. So, of course, we can allow for other types of minorities, women, sexual minorities to come in, and they're going to pluralize in a different way. But they, they tend to operate as rarefied elites within uh, society and culture versus the, the, the way that I'm sort of very interested in recently is demanding a kind of mutual respect for mm-hmm. the type of authors that are not architects, mm-hmm. but who manage the built environment, which is a, a different sort of attitude than saying that contractors and regular people just take our scraps and image with them, but that they're producing something, and that there's authorship there that we don't understand because it hasn't been abstract or aligned with the type of writing that we have. Right. Right. What I would say to that is that ambition, I think, is golden, but it's not the custom yet. And I think that it's up for us to then not just question ourselves, but push push custom into its next phase. And uh, uh, but yeah, that's uh, that that's ideally where it goes. Right. You know, <laughs> but it's not there yet. I know great, you got to end, go right? But great conversation, and I want to ask a question about what Corey was asking, his theory dying in the sense, remember in the 90s, East Coast schools were pedagogically theoretical, West mm-hmm. Coast was formally trained to look at the big prism, and then there was that migration that happened. Right. And I feel like what's happening in the last 10 years is that, remember, middle of America was, there was no mm-hmm. town for East Coast or West mm-hmm. Coast. That was the last cities that merged with all these city, less felt city mm-hmm. schools and moved to the south. Do you think this kind of merging has affected and transformed the notion of what theory is? Um, yeah, but I think that there's a sort of fundamental disconnect at this point um, because I think that those, I, I think that the emergent properties of theory that happened at the beginning, at you know, the, the late 90s to the beginning of the 21st century and the uh, prescriptive kind of uh, theoretical understandings of like that East Coast haven't ever really, sometimes I find that like when I'm talking with East Coast 
colleagues that I'll say a theoretical term and it just doesn't mean the same thing, you know? And again, that has to do with the shifting custom. We haven't quite shifted to that yet, but I think that as we see these, you know, middle and, and really, really what I hope global south schools and so forth taking the lead on these conversations i think we're going to start to unveil new definitions that i think are going to become more of the operational definitions but like right now even just saying the word theory you know it's like a um, the blind man and the elephant kind of story right you know it's a this it's a that and um uh so you know, um, but I, I'm, I'm really looking forward and hope, and we have to keep conscientiously fostering the idea that, you know, for, I think for, for a lot of the, the schools in that great middle, I think that it is because they're so practice oriented, right? You know, and that that practice orientation is building new ideas about what theory is. And I think that for the global south, it's like, hey, listen to us. We've been saying this, <laughs> these things for you know hundreds of years, and, and people are finally going, oh, oh. <laughs> well, not people, but you know, a particular privileged dominant discourse is finally going, oh, yeah, that's interesting. But we have to make room. We have to consistently make room for those things, yeah. All right, well, yeah, I think we should end it there. We're a little over time, but thank you so much, Dora. Excellent lecture. Thanks for Wonderful the Wonderful conversation. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah.